a very warm welcome to all of you to this 11th uh, Christel Stendahl Memorial Lecture. Uh, it's a pleasure for us at the Center for Interfaith Dialogue in the Diocese of Stockholm to, uh, together with Paideia, the European Institute of <coughs> Jewish Studies in Sweden, did I get that right now? Yeah, to present this lecture. Uh, in memory of Christus Stendhal, who was Bishop of Stockholm, 1994 to 84 no, to 88, wasn't it? Yes. And we're especially happy to have uh, Christus' family, his son and daughter, and uh, and um, daughter-in-law. Daughter that's it. Uh, here with us today. That's what we have. And we also have the students of Paideia, which is always a great pleasure to meet you as well. Um, so we will uh, listen to the lecture. There will be a question and answer session, and then there will be a reception outside with something to uh, nibble on and a drink, and you can all continue the conversation out there. Socialize. Socialize, yes. So it's my... Joy and privilege to introduce Katharina von Kellenbach, <coughs> Professor Katharina von Kellenbach, to give this year's lecture. She is currently Corcoran Visiting Chair in Christian Jewish Relations at the Center for Christian Jewish Learning in Boston College. And uh, yeah, I wanted to show two, you two of Katharina's books, which we have in our library. Katharina has, of course, published a lot of essays and contributions to, to uh, anthologies and so on, and she has written at least two monographies. The first, which was very important for me as I did my doctoral studies, is <laughs> Anti-Judaism in Feminist Religious Writings. And then the latest one is The Mark of Cain, Guilt and Denial in the Post-War Lives of Nazi Perpetrators. And I think those two books summarize uh, the focus of your uh, research interest, feminism and uh, Holocaust studies. And um, the question of guilt, you have been um, working with that, especially the last year. Uh, Katharina von Kellenbach has been the convener of a project called Felix Kulpa. Guilt as a culturally productive force at the University of Bielefeld, an international interdisciplinary research project. And I guess that what we will hear today will be one of the outcomes of that project, isn't that right? So I give the floor to Professor von Kellenbach. Give her a hand. something that uh, has very little to do with him. 
Um, this is a quote from a tribute Christoph Stendhal that his two colleagues, Helmut Köster and Daniel J. Harrington, gave in, a, uh, in an article called Tri Tribute to Christoph Stendhal. And there they say, thanks to Christoph Stendhal, I have learned that as a Christian, I belong to a people that is burdened with the guilt of a long history of the persecution of Jewish people culminating in the Holocaust. So that is how they uh, sort of crystallized the legacy uh, of Christus Stendhal. So what does this mean then? Um, that's going to be my topic today, especially since really nobody likes to talk about guilt. Guilt is a bad word and it leaves sort of almost a bad smell. And it takes a considerable convincing, both for myself as well as for anybody else, to return to the question of guilt. And I think that's especially also true for Christians, because we always think about guilt in the context of redemption, sin and forgiveness. And it is all about reconciliation and forgiveness most of the preaching, and guilt and sin is sort of just the, the thing just before that. And that's also true in secular scholarship. So for the last 20 years, we've done a lot of thinking, both theoretically and practically, about reconciliation and about forgiveness. But no thinking about what exactly guilt is and what exactly happens to it when it is forgiven or you know, whether anything happens to this. And let me just, since you brought up the Mark of Cain, I started this book looking at prison chaplains working with Nazi perpetrators in post-war Germany. And I began with forgiveness. And my question was, you know, what, how did the Christian message of forgiveness work out in the lives of Nazi perpetrators? And I was looking through the archives, and after 12 years of going through the archives, I had to consider myself defeated, <laughs> because there was no conversion. And there was no sense of guilt. So in other words, these Nazi perpetrators didn't ask for forgiveness, and therefore, when the ministers came in and they dispensed grace and forgiveness, it couldn't do anything and it didn't do anything. Therefore, I sort of backtracked and I started thinking about guilt, and that's the subtitle of the book, but that's not where I started. So, what is guilt? I want to start with two main metaphors uh, through which we think about guilt, and then try to complicate those metaphors. The first metaphor is that we think and talk about guilt as defilement or pollution or impurity. And therefore, of forgiveness or redemption as a form of purification. So guilt is a stain, oftentimes a blood stain, that needs to be washed. And redemption is a form of washing. And that is a metaphor that is frankly both throughout uh, the Bible as well as uh, Christian theology, but it's also very true in secular language as well. And it is, at the end, the problem why when we talk about forgiveness, it's linked to forgetting. Because once it is washed away, <coughs> it's gone. So you forgive and you forget. The problem is, uh, and this is not only true, again, not just true for Christianity, it's true actually for all of the religions, and it is rooted in, in our bodies. So social psychologists have recently run tests, and they found that when you uh, remind test subjects of some wrongdoing, they request soap and toothpaste uh, as a reward for the test. So, and they call this the Macbeth effect. And the Macbeth effect is, of course, uh, named after Shakespeare, where Lady Macbeth is washing her hands uh, to, to get rid of the blood guilt. 
So the problem with any kind of washing metaphor or purification ritual is that every moment you wash, you actually create sewage, which is why I have this image there. Mm -hmm. right, so every time we wash, we create dirt. And it goes somewhere. Right? So my, uh, the topic that I'm looking at and that I'm investigating is what happens after washing. Are washing metaphors really the right metaphor to think about the after effect, the long-term consequences of guilt, or do we need different kinds of images as well as practices to take guilt more seriously in the long term? The second metaphor that we have is of guilt as a burden, something that we carry and something that can be transferred Right? The scapegoat is the model so that the sins can be transferred onto the scapegoat and then the scapegoat goes away. And, and your sins and your guilt go away as well. And again, that is also part of uh, the model of the passion story, that Christ died for our sins and he lifted, uh, he, he takes our burdens and, and his death by substitutionary <coughs> atonement as a substitute takes away um, the guilt. Now, of course, um, here again, we are running out of spaces. We no longer have desert uh, where we can store the guilt. And it's also interesting that Gehenna, um, there's some debate among uh, historians whether Gehenna does refer to the garbage dump outside Jerusalem or not, but Gehenna, the term, is associated with a garbage site where it was burned, you know, the trash was burned. So that is, so where hell, you know, becomes the receptacle, uh, the, the toxic waste dump. So just as with sewage, I'm interested in garbage dumps, <laughs> long term, and how we deal with uh, those toxic remainders of culpable histories long after you know we have ostensibly forgiven uh, and, and it's all gone. So in other words I'm looking for an ecological shift that validates the, the materiality of legacies of wrongdoing, both of our moral wrongdoing but also our material wrongdoing and how to create sort of sustainable modes of dealing uh, with guilt. In other words, I'm looking for new metaphors. One of them is in sewage plants. Fascinating places. <laughs> when you think about uh, what actually happens there, and there you no longer think in terms of purification, but in terms of clarification. And there are different phases to this model. Um, there are periods when time slows down and everything sediments. And then there are times when it uh, becomes activated, aerated, and oxygen, you know, these sc historical scandals come to place, and these very painful exposures. And of course, the entire time there is digestion going on, bacterial dige digestion is going on. And then you have these, um, which in German are called Faultur, you know, where the foul, the foul stuff uh, is sort of stored. And in the end, you end up with compost. So in other words, um, this is a very different model to think about guilt um, that is not sort of situated on somehow removing it, but really focuses on digestion and eventual decontamination and eventual uh, fertile soil, fertile source of new growth, okay? So that instead of uh, cutting off and closing histories of culpable wrongdoing, uh, we are really looking for ways to make them uh, into the ground of new being. Because really, it doesn't go anywhere anyway, so you might as well get used to it. That we cannot bury 
our way out of culpable wrongdoings. And remember, I speak as a German with Nazi perpetrators in my family, right? And Germans, we've tried pretty much everything to get rid of this history, and we're much happier since we have accepted this history as part of our identity. So I want to switch now from, and I want you to keep this, these models and these images in your mind as we're talking about Jewish-Christian relations, of which the Holocaust is the culmination. It's a very long history. <coughs> um, and so as I was beginning to shift into guilt in Jewish-Christian relations, the first thing that I realized is that guilt is a very ambivalent force because for the longest time, it was the Jews who were guilty. So when you think about guilt in Jewish-Christian relations, you're thinking about Jewish guilt. And Christian guilt did not even come into view until Jewish guilt was repudiated. And that historically took almost 20 years after the Holocaust. It's most frightate. And I'll go through this history in just a moment. But the violence against Jews, Christian violence against Jews, was always predicated on the fact that the Jews were guilty for persecuting, arresting, uh, and killing Christ. That is their guilt. Jews were blind, Jews were arrogant, Jews rejected their Messiah, and Jews were guilty of deicide. And because they were guilty, they deserved to be punished by God, by transferring the promises of the Hebrew Bible over to the new Israel and the church, and by the church. And anti-Judaism was never considered a problem by Christian theologians until the Holocaust, after the Holocaust, really. And I think that's a very important point to keep in mind, that their Christian theology did not feel guilty for victimizing, <coughs> denigrating, persecuting, expelling Jews because it was the right thing to do. So guilt is also an argument to commit violence, punitive force, right? So that's something to keep in mind. Guilt is not innocent. And it is easily manipulated, and it's certainly at the source of a lot of violence. So this uh, tradition of, uh, and by the way, you know, we could have another whole le 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 lecture on whether or not the Nazis were Christian or not. They were, of course, not Christian, but uh, they were all baptized, or they would have been Jewish, right? And they used Christian tropes to great effect. So without the legacy of Christian anti-Judaism, the Holocaust would not have happened, even though the, there is a shift into modern, racist, scientifically-based uh, thinking. Uh, as well as a, you know, an anti-Christian uh, sentiment within National Socialism, but without the tropes of Christian anti-Judaism, the violence that the Nazis unleashed across Europe, not just in Germany, but across Europe, would not have been possible. So the ICCJ met in Seligsburg in 1947. This is among the first meetings of Jews and Christians right after the Holocaust. And the 10 points of Seligsburg that were uh, passed at this meeting in collaboration and in dialogue between Jews and Christians had two <coughs> points that demanded that the Christian churches look at Jewish guilt. <coughs> Number seven said, avoid presenting the passion in such a way as to bring the odium of the killing of Jesus upon all Jews or upon Jews alone. It was only a section of the Jews in Jerusalem who demanded the death of Jesus, and the Christian message has always been that it was the sins of mankind which were exemplified by those Jews, and the sins by, in which all men share that brought Christ to the cross. 
So when we think about collective guilt, and that is also a huge topic, especially in Germany, the only group for whom collective guilt held any kind of significant truth was the Jews from 19th century. It was the Jews collectively who were held responsible throughout all ages and in all places for this one act of violence. I mean, it's a nonsensical idea, and you think how powerful uh, this has remained throughout Christian uh, history is really quite astounding. So in 1948, just to give you the, the frame of this, because this the ICCJ was very much on the on the on the forefront of this. So in 1948, the Reichsbruderrat, this is the Council of Confessing Pastors, um, pastors of the Confessing Church, <coughs> to issue a statement on the Jews. And they write, so the first one, they disavow, you know, they, they commit, they sort of say something about German guilt vis-a-vis -vis the Jewish people, which if you know German, Jewish, I mean, Christian history, the Stuttgart Declaration of Guilt does not mention the Holocaust, right? The church takes on guilt, but does not mention <coughs> Jews. So this is a statement that speaks specifically to the fate of the Jews. But read points number two and five. So num point number two says, in crucifying the Messiah, Israel has rejected its election and vocation. All of humankind has repudiated the Christ of God in this event. We are all co-guilty for the crucifixion of Christ. Therefore, the church is not allowed to stigmatize the Jews as solely guilty for the cross of Christ. They're really skirting here. And then number five, Standing under the judgment of God, Israel confirms the irrefutable truth and reality of the word of God to the continuous admonition of his church. That God cannot be mocked is the silent sermon of the Jewish faith, as a warning to us and as an exhortation to the Jews to consider conversion to the one in whom alone rests their salvation. This is three years after the Holocaust by German pastors of the Confessing Church trying to speak about German Christian guilt. And they just cannot get themselves across the D side charge. Uh, this is a Synagoga Ecclesia, you all know this, and you have your own discussion in Sweden about uh, the triumphant church and the blind synagogue who will you know, the Torah is dropping out of her hands. I, I won't say much about it. So it takes until 1965 in Nostra Aetate that uh, the Christian churches more or less unambiguously disavow the deicide charge. Uh, his passion cannot be charged against all the Jews without distinction then allowed, nor against the Jews today. Although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or accursed by God, as if this followed from the Holy Scriptures. This is the first 20 years, right, after the Holocaust, the first time that the church more or less unambiguously disavows the DHI charge. There is nothing on Christian complicity in the Holocaust in Nostra Aetate. The church does not go so far as to say, we are guilty of, you know, responsible, complicit in. That takes until Jerusalem 2000. Right, that's why I have this image there. It is only in 2000 that Pope John Paul II and the church, as a representative of the church, can unambiguously say, we apologize to the Jews for what? The sons and daughters of the church have done. That's a Catholic problem. We don't have to go there. But you know, it's as, as close as, as he, can, he can get. And by the way, when I teach students, um, and I don't know how, what, how this is in Sweden, but my students look at me with big eyes when I talk about the D side charge. It's, it's sort of news to them that the Jews were held guilty. So I'm, I'm assuming that 
in terms of education as well as in terms of preaching, the D side charge is no longer the central message that is being transmitted uh, in, in churches. So um, I do think that you know a lot has changed in that. Although my students also love this film, which revives it, right? So here again, uh, you know, the poison has been named, but it has not been entirely removed. Um, and we, we, have to, uh, we have to remain uh, cognizant of that. So I want to um, now go into uh, sort of what to do with these legacies. And I, I want to give you two examples. But I want to start with a story um, that turns out to be a fake story. Um, and speaks to a continuing interreligious polemics. If you go online and you look up Martin Luther's snow covered dunghill, uh, you will find this story. And uh, it goes something like this uh, Martin Luther is uh, explaining the doctrine of justification and it's winter time, and he directs his students' attention to outside where there's a dunghill. Um, and it's snowing. And three hours later, he says, uh, to, the, to the students, see, look, look at this dunghill, and it's all covered in white, right? It's pure. And then he says, and this is how the, how the doctrine of justification works, because Christ's um, passion covers the sins of, you know, of a sinful humanity. Now, it sounds enough like Martin Luther that he should be talking about dunghills that you think, oh, you know, maybe there's a No, it is in fact a Catholic polemic against the doctrine of justification. Martin Luther never said this. I checked. It took a long time, you know, checked every reference to shit and dunghill and manure, <laughs> and there's plenty. It, this story is not, cannot be attributed. And it is, um, of course, part of the polemic, which actually I, growing up Lutheran, always heard about the, about the Catholics, that they're clean on the outside because they perform you know, their sacraments externally, but on the inside, you know, they're totally impure. And so now the Catholics are turning this around and saying, that's what justification does. It cleanses on the outside of the cup, right? It goes all the way back to the Pharisees but the inside is impure. So this is a very old uh, polemic um, that is uh, going on. And of course, it speaks to the fact that when it comes to guilt, you know, this is sort of at the heart of the Reformation. And the debate between Protestantism and Catholic Catholicism over how to do this. So I just thought I would remind you, you all know this very much better and are aware of this. But for the Protestants, it is of course, you know, the grace of God is unconditional. Forgiveness is granted without uh, any, you know, even the question of whether or not you are contrite, whether or not you have repented, whether or not you have confessed. So that is sort of the classic Protestant doctrine of justification, which if we can remember put you back to the mark of Cain, you know, drove me crazy that these prison chaplains go into the cells of Nazi perpetrators and say, you have been forgiven. But, you know, there's no con consciousness of what they, you know, that killing Jews might be a problem. Um, and they never confess to any of this. And they never consider themselves guilty of any of this. So the Roman Catholic side, on the other hand, is a sacramental process. Um, it's a ritual process, that is to say, it is things you do externally, um, and it involves three steps. Contrition of the heart, confession of the mouth, and uh, satisfying works, you know, some kind of action. And uh, then, of course, there is absolution. Now, on the Protestant side, while forgiveness is unconditional because, as Martin Luther correctly pointed out, you can never know whether someone is contrite. You can never know whether confession is truthful. Right? So there's no way to prove my contrition. 
But then, of course, within the Protestant cycle, you have sanctification, where all of these steps are also required. So in other words, when somebody has done wrong, even secular people expect, you know, have certain expectations of a process that ought to happen before we're willing to extend forgiveness. Right? It has to have involved some kind of remorse, some kind of expression of uh, contrition. It has to be involved some form of being able to speak truthfully to what, what has happened. And we expect some kind of restitution. And or some kind of punishment, right? Some kind of sacrifice on the part of the perpetrator. Whether you do that before you grant absolution, as in the Catholic case, or whether you do that after you grant <coughs> absolution, you know, there is some kind of process. So this is the kind of process that I'm uh, interested in when it comes to my sewage plants. <laughs> right? Uh, because that is where I can start thinking about the practicalities of how we engage with histories of wrongdoing. So I am proposing that Contritia Cordis, the Cartfeld Contrition, uh, I re rename those as rituals of repudiation. I'm going to talk about what I mean. Public apologies, uh, somehow you know, purging people from office, for instance. Um, some kind of, you know, penal action uh, that uh, disempowers wrongdoers within the institutions. Confessio oris are rituals of lustration, some form of seeking truth and speaking truth. Education, commemoration, right? All of those bring back into awareness and, and create a language to talk about culpable histories. And third, satisfactory, <coughs> satisfactory operas, rituals of penitentiary and restitution, some form of reparation, dialogue, engagement, you know, trying to uh, repair some of the damage. So I'm going to look at this in two cases. One is uh, Martin Luther's On the Jews and Their Lies. Right? What would a process like this look like in how the Lutheran tradition can, you know, can go through a process of repentance. You know, what is required uh, as we go through this? Um, so first of all, it's probably a good thing to read once more what Martin Luther wrote. Because we also, of course, need to think about whether you know, this is sort of a dirty secret that we can ignore. I mean, Martin Luther is a giant as are many of our other theological greats. So what do we do with the fact when we stumble upon these passages that are outrageous, right? Do we just ignore them? Do we translate them? Do we use them? Do they actually sort of contaminate the truth of what they were teaching, right? I mean, is it sort of a small segment or is it, does it pollute the entire work? Um, so Martin Luther in 1543, this is the most outrageous statement. Um, and I want to read this to you because this was then <coughs> relevant and put into practice in 1938, November 9, which is coming up, right? So very soon we will commemorate Kristallnacht. First, to set fire to their synagogues or schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed. Third, I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings be taken from them. Fourth, I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of loss of life and limb. Fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the high highways be abolished completely for the Jews. I wish and I ask that our rulers who have Jewish subjects exercise a sharp mercy toward these wretched people. They must act like a good physician who, when gangrene sets in, proceeds without mercy to cut, saw, and burn flesh, veins, bone, and marrow. 
deal harshly with them as Moses did in the wilderness, slaying 3,000, lest the whole people perish. This book was then reissued on, in November 1938, three days after the, uh, the synagogues in Germany burned. There was a parade in honor of Martin Luther's birthday that walked past the destroyed synagogue, and people felt, Martin Sasse being one of them, that they were doing the right thing. Okay. And it's, it's, it's very hard to remember that the Nazis were acting in good conscience. They did not feel guilty. They killed Jews feeling justified. And Martin Luther plays a large part in that, in that story. So uh, the Lutheran churches, of course, have afterwards, first of all, were confronted with this writing. Uh, and this is now, I'm speaking now for the American uh, Evangelical Lutheran Church, which in the first instance required translating this text from German into English, because most American Lutherans had never read this text. Right? So it was translated into English. And the American Lutheran Church then in 1994 repudiated this text. In the spirit of that truth telling, we who bear his name must with pain acknowledge also Luther's anti Judaic diatribes and the violent recommendations of his later writing against the Jews. As did many of Luther's own companions in the 16th century. We reject this violent invective, and yet more do we express our deep and abiding sorrow over its tragic effects on subsequent generations. Right? So a very clear rejection of this teaching on the part of the church, which was reiterated in this summer in 2019 in commemoration of the 25th anniversary of the ELCA, Declaration for the Jewish Community, we remember, again, the legacy of the reformer Martin Luther. Renew us in the, renew them in the spirit of his truth-telling that we who bear his name reaffirm and make public our repudiation of Luther's anti judaic diatribes and of the violent recommendations in his later writings against the Jews. So you see two steps here, right? It's about truth-telling, illustration, and it's about repudiation. Uh, which is the apology. So, and these two things sort of belong, you know, belong together, and they are ritual. That is to say, it is not enough to do it once. That would be a washing away. But you have to do it repeatedly. It's a process. However, um, I, I want to sort of bring up, this is an image from Amazon taken two days ago. Okay? It's a bestseller. And it is being recommended by Amazon. It's, by the way, the same translation that was done into English. And when you look at, um, first of all, you know, what other items do customers buy after viewing this item? You know, you can see that anti-Semitism is alive and well. And then you look at the comment section, and they love it. So uh, last, I mean, am I too close? What am I doing here? Um, so, you know, we were just debating, and I, I want to throw this out to you all, uh, you know, last weekend at Nuremberg, what is our obligation as Lutherans, as a Lutheran church, as Lutheran people, to repudiate and to lustrate, right? I mean, to, to tell the truth, because it's, it's, it's not gone, right? Just because we repudiate does not mean that the poison has therefore, thereby lost its virulence. And of course, part, and part of the question is also, what, what do people like about this? Why does it, what does anti-Judaism serve 
in the Christian imagination. It's doing something for us, or we wouldn't buy it. We wouldn't like it. And we need to really get to the roots of this, um, uh, of this desire that's being fed by these, um, by these texts. So that's, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this because we have not yet uh, fully come to, come to grips with this, right? And this is Facebook, Twitter, Amazon. These are electronic forms of transmission that, uh, that are hitting us, you know, in entirely new ways where as churches we have lost uh, control and authority over the message. Right. So we're, we're in an entirely new environment here uh, when it comes with how to deal with this. So let me talk about what, what, what's happening. Uh, something is happening here? Okay, here we go. Um, let me talk about the third step, uh, the rituals of penitentiary uh, restitution. That is to say, um, how do we, what needs to happen within both the Christian but also our secular societies that instead of the hate of the other, we actually transform that into respect, right? I mean, how do we transform the teaching of contempt into a teaching of respect? <coughs> um, because we can't just say contempt is bad, right? Repudiation and is, not, is not enough just to condemn anti-Semitism. We all agree publicly anyway, that anti-Semitism is a bad thing. It continues to thrive, so we need to get to the emotional component of this, and we need to transform it, the composting mode, right, into something that becomes, again, active, right, that is alive. So, uh, rituals of penetrancy and restitution are a form of engagement that draws people into action. Um, and into relationship with Jews. Um, so I want to give you the example of Dresden. I understand that the diocesan staff, you know, traveled to Dresden, and I find this a very interesting um, history for multiple reasons, um, but mostly for the fact that uh, when the people of Dresden. Uh, overthrew its government, by the way, in a non-violent way, uh, they felt the need to rebuild the cathedral, which had remained a rubble throughout the duration of East Germany, which is also remarkable, right, to think about. And it was, of course, a symbol of the firebombing of Dresden. Um, and so there was a, uh, a committee, a, a call from Jason went out all across the world asking for uh, funds, private funds, to rebuild this cathedral. And it was mostly people from Great Britain, America, Canada, Australia, who had actually flown the bombing missions against Jason, mm -hmm. who donated monies to rebuild this church. Uh, the entire costs for this project were about 250 million euros, and more than half came from abroad. It also involved, by the way, entirely new uh, technologies, uh, which have since been used in rebuilding the Buddhas in Banya, uh, because it required, you know, separating this pile of rubble. Uh, and, and numbering each piece, and then you know redesigning it into this into this cathedral. Well, from the very beginning, so this is going on between 1990, and the church was actually uh, dedicated in 2005, and it was an 11-year process. Um, from the beginning, the committee that raised the funds for the church decided that if they were going to rebuild the church, they had to rebuild the synagogue. And you saw an image of the synagogue, that was the synagogue of Dresden that was burned down, and actually the Star of David had been saved by a fireman who climbed on the, on the roof and took down the Star of David, and it was hidden 
uh, throughout the time. And so this group then organized a separate fundraising committee to raise 20 million euros, so it's 250 million for the church and 20 million to build a synagogue. Now mind you, this, the Jewish community in Dresden was 6,000 Jews in 1933. And there were, let me just get my numbers right, uh, there were 49 Jews who survived mm -hmm. the Holocaust. Um, and no, that's actually in 1949. So in, in 1945, it was 250. Mm -hmm. By 1989, that number had turned into 49. So survivors, I visited that congregation in the mid 80s with a bunch of very elderly survivors who were in Dresden in that. Um, and so eventually, it, you know, it whittled away. So a, a, a group of 49 Jews don't need a new synagogue, you could argue, right? And so there's lots of ways in which that decision on the part of uh, the group that rebuilt the church, that they were also going to rebuild the synagogue, is problematic. And the fundraising arm for that consisted of the Protestant bishop, the Catholic bishop of uh, Saxony, and the minister president of Saxony. So church and state decided to build a synagogue. Very problematic on the one hand. On the other hand, it's also a way in which uh, the church decided that it did not want a future without the synagogue, right? And take responsibility for that. And not only that, but the committee also went around and they, uh, they wanted money from the population. I'm just reading you uh, from a newspaper um, of one of those fundraising arms where the minister, uh, Pastor Sigrid Ryman, he said this, every donation counts, everyone should decide how much they can contribute. We cannot expect that everybody donates a thousand marks, but maybe 50 are possible. Because one thing is obvious, the small Jewish community cannot pay the money that will be needed. We should not forget that it is not the fault of the Jews that they no longer have a synagogue. The destruction of the synagogue, as well as the persecution and the murder of the Jews, is a past that we must all bear together although we were not personally involved. We must give a response to this history. This is a chance to approach this subject on a personal level and to remember this past atrocity. This is true for each individual as well as organizations, banks, and businesses. Ryman reminded everyone that the Dresdner Bank was originally a Jewish establishment and the Dresdner Bank increased this, its donation from 50,000 to something more. So this was a guilt project, right? Um, but that does not necessarily mean that it was not welcomed by the Jewish community that had in fact been growing in part because the German government also decided to recruit Soviet Jewish emigres into Germany and to really um, provide a space where Jews are welcomed. Again, we, this is sort of selfish, right? It's impure in many respects, and yet that does not necessarily mean that it's false. So, you know, we can talk about uh, the problems of this. So, on November 9, 1989, 60 years after the Semper Synagogue uh, was torched, the ground was broken in a ceremony that commemorated the pogrom of 1938. And three years later, on November 9, 2001, the synagogue was dedicated and the Jewish community moved in. So at this point, um, there are, the congregation has 700 members. Uh, they have a 29-year-old rabbi who was born in Germany. And the fundraising committee that secured the funds to build the synagogue has now reinvented itself as an ongoing fundraising arm for the upkeep of the synagogue, which is huge, as you can tell. And it is also interesting that, as opposed to the church, which is a replica, mm. 
his synagogue went for the third uh, proposal in that uh, international competition and decided to go with something radically different. It's on the same ground uh, as the old synagogue, but it is an entirely new design. And they, they said there is no going back. And obviously, you know, Dresden synagogue is gone. It cannot be rebuilt, right? So there is no repair in that respect. That is why I would talk about you know, rituals of penitentiary restitutions. Right? It's a form <laughs> of returning by investing in the future you know, of, of that. And making the future of the church dependent upon the future of the synagogue. And I think in Germany, that is I mean, the near extinction of Jewish life in Germany. Really woke up the Christian churches you know, to anti-Judaism and the realization <coughs> that there is no Christianity without the Jewish presence. So that instead of looking at the Jews through a lens of guilt, right, and as something, as a problem that ought to be solved, it turns Jews into, a, into, a, you know, into something that is part of any kind of salvation history. You know, any kind of future uh, of the church. So with that, I want to sort of go back to my notion of purification of guilt and come up with different models of purity, right? What constitutes purity? Because um, it's not a cleanliness that wipes away the wrongdoing, right? There's no forgiving and forgetting, but it is a form of taking it in until there is a genuine change at the core of, of the Christian tradition. Now, we are talking about almost 20 years of anti-Judaism, right? The poison is very, very deep, and it's at all levels. But I think <coughs> the process and the future that we should envision is sort of um, along the lines of you know, ferment and compost. And uh, I, uh, I, I said to Helena, I was thinking in terms of purity, because the Catholic image of purity is the Virgin Mary. And that's the, that's the image that uh, Pope John Paul II used uh, when he talked about the purification of memory, he talked about the Virgin. The problem with the Virgin, other than that I'm Lutheran, is that you know, she's young and she's untouched. And she's you know, virginal. And if you have anything old, it's going to be broken. It's going to be burdened. There's going to be flaws and failure. So to the extent that Christianity is an old religion, there's going to be guilty legacies. And you know, he spoke of you know, the, the Crusades, the Inquisition, slavery. I mean, we can go through this. So to the extent that there's, there's old age, it, there's going to be guilt, and there's going to be impurity. And so then I was thinking, OK, what, what gets better with age? <laughs> so there's my my conclusion in terms of you know what how we can deal with guilty legacies as we move into the future. Okay, thank you very much for this. <laughs>
I'm thinking about nationalism. And I'm thinking about, uh, I hope my dear Swedish friends forgive me, the cross on the Swedish flag. I'm thinking about the connection between Christianity and nationalism, which would, in my innocent way, <coughs> seem to absolve some of the, of the guilt that you're speaking about. Uh, so I, perhaps in another area, I'm not into <coughs> stations where we clean the water, but, uh, but I would like to hear your comments on the issue of the, of the connection between religion and nationalism, mm -hmm. and particularly the connection between nationalism and the rise of the European states. Is there any other question that we should take now as well, or do you want to respond, Katarina? Uh, to, to, to me, nationalism is a virus that keeps on giving because it has now affected, uh, you know, it's a global issue that wherever nationalism arises, and you know, we see that when starting with the Armenian genocide um, uh, to Rwanda, to it's, I mean, the level of um, of violence that comes with the idea of nationalism, which is also tied to purity. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm writing this book on purity and purification right now, and of course the first thing I notice is that the language of purity and purification is always at the root of genocide. Every genocidal campaign is a campaign of ethnic cleansing. And nationalism, has with it an idea of a pure exactly. nation. And once you embrace that, you immediately have the right and the responsibility and obligation to cleanse the impurity. Right? It's an extremely violent uh, mode. And it's very satisfying. Cleaning is, I mean, I'm German. You know, we like to clean. <laughs> And every act of cleansing is an act of destruction. Um, so that is very, very, you know, it's a, it's a very troubling. So I think, you know, we need to sort of rethink purity and impurity in our social systems. I mean, Mary Douglas, uh, you know, and the anthropologist talked about that dirt is defined by its placement, right? It's not the thing itself, but it's where it is situated. In other words, earth in the garden is clean, earth on the carpet is dirt, mm -hmm. right? Spit in my mouth is clean, spit on your you know, cheek is dirt, <coughs> it's disgusting. So it's about placement. And so once we have so the idea of the nation as a pure assembly of language, race, religion, whatever it is, um, we have permission. That's deadly, globally. So yeah, it's easy to construct the other in this context, right? And then go at it, yeah. right? As dirt, as as virus, you know. And then because then in the 19th century, dirt becomes pathogenic; it becomes a disease. Even a tiny, a tiny bacteria, you know, validates, erasing everything. And but you know, already Luther, you heard this. He talks about gangrene, mm -hmm. right? Gangrene. Um, the, the Jews are angry, and you have to cut off the leg, you know, in order to save the body. So I mean, that's that's the kind of language that was just all all throughout uh, Nazi Germany, and um, and it's true for other places around this globe that are currently enacting various form of cleansing campaigns. So. I'm trying to retrieve the language of purity and purification, but it's actually very hard. I gave this talk in Germany, in Berlin, and I never, I was lost. I mean, they were so angry at me. <coughs> I'm trying, because the German language of purification is just thoroughly associated with national socialist discourse. You just cannot retrieve it at all. Other questions? Yes. Back row, which should be in the front row, always the most active. <laughs> Just a brief comment that you may want to comment on. When you began, you started by saying that you did a great study and you found almost no guilt. And when you just mentioned the word guilt, I thought immediately of the, the Sunflower book by Simon Weizenthal 
where the German perpetrator, the guard, asks to meet a Jew and to talk to him, and he tells his whole story to Wiesenthal, and he begs for forgiveness. And Wiesenthal ends by saying, you can't, I can't forgive you. You, you have to talk to the people that you, that you hurt. So I assumed that there would be many such cases, and you said there weren't. It, it just strikes me as, is that really an exception? <laughs> yes. So, uh, you know, I, I went into this looking, I mean, I had read, you know, the sunflower, and I thought, I'm surely I'm going to find, you know, these stories. So I started with the Nuremberg Prize. I started in the Nuremberg Church Archive and with the ministers that were assigned to war crimes prison number one. And they accompanied all of the convicts to the gallows. And all of the last words were recorded by the ministers and by the US military authorities. I went through 480 last words looking for any sign of contrition. They all go under the gallows and they say, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm not guilty as charged. I found one example, and, uh, and the minister actually writes about how he started crying during the confession, and obviously the seal of confession is the seal of confession. I can't go into this, but there was plenty of material to have a sense of how they were speaking, also to the families and, you know, to, letters, etc., etc., And so one guy starts crying. Uh, his, his mother has a nervous breakdown, has to go to the hospital, and all the signs of severe, you know, sense of guilt. So I'm like, yay, you know, I found one. <coughs> but then, of course, my problem was always, then I had to go back and I had to figure out what they were guilty of, right? What they had been convicted of. It turns out that in war crimes prison number one were not only Nazis, but other criminals. Mm -hmm. This guy had done a black market deal over 300 cans of chocolate sauce with an American GI. They disagreed over the price. There was a fight. He killed the GI. He is convicted and sentenced to death. And he feels guilty. So if you kill one person, Everybody agrees. His mother agrees, right? the minister agrees, he agrees. There's a feeling because you committed a crime. The people who you know, ran Buchenwald, this is the vice commander of Buchenwald, he says, and the minister writes, er ist sich keiner Grausamkeit bewusst. He's not aware of any cruelty. <coughs> this is the vice commander of Buchenwald who is responsible mm. for all the punishments. And he goes under the gallows and he says, I'm, I'm not guilty. I did only, I did my job as you do, he says to the Americans, to the American executioners. Right? Wink, wink. Um, so yeah, I, I could not find it. Thank you very much. Uh, this is enlightening and uh, I just wanted to think, ask you a question about the metaphor of purity, impurity for sin and guilt. And because you started off with some quotations from the biblical quotations. And I guess what I'm wondering and a bit worried about, worried about is the close connection the metaphor of guilt and sin and impurity using biblical texts because yes, there are texts as you show that, that brings these two concepts together. Impur impurity language is used to describe sin. It's one of the sort of air metaphor areas that are applied to, to sin. But Purity language can also be used, and is usually used uh, in a very neutral sense uh, when it comes to rituals and how impurity, ritual impurity, 
function in ancient society was was a very common part of everyday life and became impure quite regularly through sex and through menstruation and childbirth and so on. <coughs> it purified and then it became pure. So and it had nothing to do with morale. And I think that aspect is very important to keep in mind that if we if we connect impurity using the Bible with sin, then I think there's a danger that we um, that we reinforce stereotypical views and misunderstandings about how purity functioned in ancient and ancient Judaism. And, and just and in modern as well. It's just a neutral thing, you impure and you purify. Uh, and also when it comes When historians, and I should also explain that I'm Cecilia Lawson, I'm a, a professor in New Testament at Uppsala University. And in historical Jesus research, it's very common among New Testament scholars to, to, to argue that Jesus took a stand against impurity laws, which is all, almost anti Jewish. They make him a bit anti Jewish. Purity, the purity system uh, was such a common way of, it was such an integral part of Jewish life. So I think that's also an added danger. Thank you. Yeah, I, have, I completely agree with you. Um, and so there, there are multiple there are levels of problems with this. Um, one is, of course, any time you uh, combine ethical and natural, you know, biological norms of anything, you are in trouble, especially post-Nazi. I mean, and I'm well aware because that's exactly what they did, right? They, they, they sort of imported natural social Darwinist, you know, genetic modes into, into an ethical and moral and religious. Um, so, I mean, that's one problem. And you're right, in the Bible you both have, you know, purity systems are neutral. I mean, they're pure and impure animals. There's pure and impure food. It's not, you know, good or bad. There's no moral uh, association with that. Um, but, you know, then there are other places where it is tinged with wrongdoing. And, uh, you know, the blood stain and, and what a community has to do in order not to be contaminated. So there is also a way in which that overlaps. Um, so I'm trying to be very careful in how, how I keep that apart. A third problem I have is that, you know, I'm speaking from a Lutheran. The Catholics already, I mean, Pope John Paul, you know, he talks about the purification of memory. There's a much thicker sort of tradition of using the language of purity, you know, the virgin, you know, they're, they're, they're just, it's a thing. <coughs> in Lutheranism, we don't do that at all. There's, there's no, no place where I could somehow um, insert myself or so connect myself. Um, and yet, here I am, <laughs> thinking about composting, because I know that composting is a powerful metaphor to uh, to insert the idea of process into guilt language because in Protestantism, I mean, as much as we know about cheap grace and as much as we try to avoid cheap grace, it's cheap grace every time <laughs> because we don't have process to really slow us down and sort of give us a you know, in, in terms of, you know, the, the <coughs> thinking about it, it, grace is too quick. That's just, it just doesn't, doesn't work practically like this. So I want to hold onto my composting idea, one way or the other. Uh, thank you very much for, for this lecture. Uh, every word, of course, uh, creates its own associations. So guilt, you have provided a whole clear bunch of associations that I, I didn't think of before, but the, the 
it's another there is an, an there is another word that comes to mind though, which is close to me, yeah. which you haven't used. Which one? Uh, I haven't told you. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a bit suspense. Okay. Would you guess? No. What is associated with guilt? Quite often. Punishment? Shame. 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 I wonder what you I, I was I had a reason some time ago to, to look at Swedish reactions to the to the Machti Benarme and the immediate persecution of Jews, the the campaigns in April of nineteen thirty three with the boycotts and, and all these things. And the reactions in the Swedish media were quite forceful and very, very strong. And uh, there was a recognition of some really civilizational break that was that was taking place here. Quite widespread. Now we know what happened. 1933 passed, 1935 passed, the Nuremberg Laws, 1938 passed. And the same people who had reacted so strongly, newspapers, clerics, bishops, realized that they were bystanders to this, and they also became a bit silent in some worse than that. And my thinking of this was that what was created in this process was a mountain, mountain of shame mm -hmm. to have been part of this because the initial reaction was a true reaction. Mm -hmm. And carrying this through silence and perhaps powerlessness, you couldn't do anything, and then you acquiesced to, to what was going on in some way or another. Uh, so I wonder if you could reflect from your perspective on the difference in using the term guilt, which is, has a judicial aspect of it. It is more linked to perpetrators, I would argue, while shame could even be assigned to the victims. I know that for a fact. People who survived the Holocaust carried shame for having survived. So and 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 the the counterweight <coughs> to shame, the, the, the reparation of shame, how to overcome shame in my little analysis was dignity. How do you retrieve your dignity after being shamed or being part of shame? A reflection. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, so the difference between guilt and shame oftentimes in the literature is that shame is is about your being and guilt is about your actions. So for instance if I stumble and fall on my face I will feel you know I feel shame even though it's not a culpable act or you know I have a, a stain on my my dress. That's that's a form of shame because I will I'm I'm seen by others and there's it's something about my being but right? irrespective of what I do. Guilt is more of an ethical term. It's about certain actions. Now, guilt is, you're absolutely right. In fact, the feeling of guilt is associated with the victims. Victims feel guilty. Perpetrators do not. In the literature, that is known as survivor guilt. And it developed in the literature post-Holocaust. But Martin Buber gave a lecture in London in 1948 before the Congress of Psychiatry, where and it was published as Guilt and Guilt Feeling. And he warned psychoanalysts to conflate those two. And he said, you have to make a difference between ontologically guilt, or what he called real guilt, i.e. what a person did, and neurotic guilt, which is also the wrong term, right? Or how people felt. Um, <coughs> and therapists did not. Uh, and of course, who goes to psychoanalysis in London, right? Who goes to therapists? It was the survivors who felt survivor guilt. And this eventually, becomes then trauma. 
And the concept of trauma is associated with guilt. So PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome, has four symptoms, and one of them is guilt. Very interesting. And then there's a whole literature on whether or not perpetrators are traumatized. And I just you know, published a piece, argued very forcefully that I don't think they were traumatized. Because they, they slept well. On the whole, I mean, I'm not saying that there's not an, an, an exceptions to this, but on the whole, they did not go to therapy, they did not go to confession, they, you know, they felt fine. And by the way, something similar is going on when it comes to sexual assault, right? Victims feel shame and guilt, and rapists feel fine. So guilt and guilt feelings a very, you know, there, there's sort of a, a real split between the two, which is why I stay away from guilt feelings because I don't, I don't see that among anti-Semites, among perpetrators. That's not their problem, and they also don't feel ashamed. In the written portion to this lecture, I have a sentence that until the Holocaust, no Christian theologian felt shame for despising, denigrating, degrading Jews. And we just had a discussion last weekend over whether that's true. And we were trying to think of one theologian who felt ashamed for being an anti-Semite. And they agreed with me. That shame comes if it comes. I don't think it came. I think we can say that. After the Holocaust, that Christian theologians felt, felt shame for you know, Martin Luther's writing. So, <coughs> you know, what, what changed, right? And what triggers, what triggers contrition? Contrition is an interesting term, and which is why you know, the whole Reformation, they're fighting over this. What is contrition, and what triggers contrition? And I agree with Martin Luther. Contrition does not come from nothing. It's, it's not sort of there. Just because you do something wrong doesn't mean you feel contrition. Something has to shift before remorse starts. And we can call that grace. I mean, I would, I would also call that grace, but I also think it needs a lot of external pressure. And just to sort of give you an example, um, when you look at Austria and Germany in terms of how they dealt with the Holocaust, Germany got all the pressure. It's not because there's something internal, right, some kind of guilt feeling, but there was a lot of pressure, a lot of vigilance ongoing for decades, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, right? And that pressure grew contrition. And Austria, and by the way, Adolf Hitler was Austrian. They should have kept the border up to the <laughs> south, build a wall. <laughs> There was no guilt until Waldheim, right? Very late, it, it occurs to them that maybe you know a good chunk of the of the SS and perpetrators were Austrian. Stanley, Eichmann, you can go through this. They're all Austrians, but it wasn't their problem. Nobody took them, you know, to task, and so therefore it doesn't happen. So I believe in in external pressure, long term. Are we, done? we are done with this part, okay. yes. and uh, we are all now welcome to stay around to continue the conversation. There is some drinks and snacks outside. Professor von Kellenbach, it's uh, such an honor and a pleasure for us to have you here. Thank you for sharing your research, your thoughts, your work. We wish you best of luck in the continuous work. And as a small, small gift of gratitude, we would like to give you the um, favorite tea of Christus Theandal himself um, as a memory for, for you being here and, and sharing your work with us. Thank you so much for, for, for today. Thank you.